quickly um, talk about, you know, what you think. You have some interest in interesting perspectives on Nigeria's socioeconomic uh, development. In fact, I read your article uh, in a, di a business day uh, newspapers where uh, you did uh, talk about, uh, you know, mobilizing debt capital in the country. You also talked about the power of the diaspora. Uh, you spoke about the informal sector. You also spoke about Nigeria's brand. And for me, that, you know, struck a chord for me because I've been wondering what Nigeria's brand is over the years. But let me uh, start with your own assessment, especially for those that haven't seen that article or for uh, my viewers that, you know, haven't heard you speak. Well, I, I think what happens sometimes is we listen to business programs and we listen to economists and they have a very kind of formal way of looking at things. So we've spent the last few years really trying to dive into what's actually happening in the Nigerian economy. So to begin with, you mentioned the diaspora. The truth is that without the diaspora remittances, the country would be effectively uh, bankrupt. Uh, and people don't talk about that enough. So we always say we're an oil economy. But we're not an oil economy. Our biggest export is people. And in that 2018, we received $25 billion in official remittances. The amount that was transferred from NNPC to the Federation account was only $10 billion. So our biggest export is people. And we need, to, we need that money here in Nigeria. Mm. It's very interesting that you say our biggest export uh, is uh, the Nigerian uh, people. Because we have about 15 million people in the diaspora, I'm guessing so, at least the uh, latest data that we have about 15 million people uh, in the diaspora that bring in close to $25 billion. Uh, and that's perhaps official uh, because like in your article, you also mentioned that the aboki part of it <laughs> is not also captured. So we might be getting about $40 billion into the country, uh, which is, you know, almost what kind of percentage? Perhaps over 10% of Nigeria's GDP. How should we begin to tap the Nigerian diaspora market for more value? Well, I, I think that, uh, that we've already started this process. You're exactly right. If, if we actually have 40 billion, it covers all of our imports because Nigeria covered, imports about 40 billion dollars. So I think in terms of the diaspora, at the Nigerian federal government level, we've now created the di diaspora commission, so not just a special advisor to the president. And they're going to come out with policies to support the diaspora and help the diaspora become more connected. But we think perhaps even more important is we would like to see the states connect to their diaspora. So if we take an example from India, which is very similar in many ways to Nigeria, they have a tremendous diaspora program, but a lot of it happens at the state level because people are more attract, attached to Imo or Edo or Kaduna uh, or Ibo land than they are necessarily to the federal government. So we would like to encourage all states to um, reach out to their own diaspora, and we at PwC are going to create a playbook uh, to help them do that. Now, Dr. Nevin, um, the way the diaspora remittances is actually captured, is it captured in the right way? Because you see quite a lot of people sending money to their folks here in Nigeria for their medical expenses, for their parents, um, building of houses, you know, sending their folks to school and all of that. Uh, so we are not really tapping into the power of the diaspora. What can we really begin uh, to do to see that those channels of funds, uh, uh, you know, are well tapped into and not just okay, my brother just sent me $100 or two or $300, or I want to get married and my brother just sent me $1,000 to support my wedding and all of that. Well, I think to begin with, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with the diaspora sending money to support people's basic needs. And millions of people in this country, uh, education, uh, even basic feeding, certainly health care, uh, receive that. So, But in the surveys that have been done about 70% of the diaspora remittance is meant for consumption. Nothing wrong with that. But in terms of investment, I think there's two types of investment. One is there are some members of the diaspora that want to support projects in a CSR type way. Um, and for those people, again, that will happen really, we think, more at the state or the local level. They want to support things from their state of origin. So the states need to organize these projects in a way that they can present them to their diaspora and that they know that there's uh, tracking of what's happening. 
happening, that there's governance of the way the funds are being spent. Because what really worries the diaspora is they send money in and nothing happens. Then there's another part of the diaspora that wants to invest in Nigeria because they see the potential and the returns. And again, uh, in our view, that has to really be driven by the private sector. There needs to be people to put together funds that then are professionally managed and invest in projects that are going to earn people um, a return on that. So I think all three of these things are, are fine, but we have the uh, remittances coming to support current consumption. We just need better structures to support people that want to do CSR and a private sector-led initiative for big funds for people that want to actually invest, uh, invest in Nigeria, but in things that produce a return. Now, Dr. Neville, what, what kind of structures do you mean? Uh, what kind of structures would you want to see from this administration, for example? I do know that uh, they've created the Diaspora Commission, uh, which Abike Dabiri uh, is the chief executive officer. What other kind of structures uh, do you think that can help us, you know, realign uh, diaspora remittances uh, to, you know, give us more value, even beyond consumption, just like you said? Well, I think that it's not going to be driven again by the federal government. If we're going to have a diaspora fund, I would say it would be a private sector fund. I mean, we obviously, I think the country would need the diaspora commission, the federal government, to support it in some sense. But it can be a private sector driven fund um, that has very clear rules of governance. So if we even t actually take one government institution here, the National Sovereign Investment Authority, they have very good governance, very well run. So a similar type of thing for the diaspora. But the other aspect about a diaspora fund is it has to be liquid. So if the, someone in the diaspora who invests, say, um, $50,000, $10,000, $5,000, they need to be able to go in and out because they're an individual on that. So in effect, we'd have to create a listed fund, probably listed in the United States and the UK because that's where the diaspora is. And then they would have allocations to certain asset classes. They may buy some government bonds, particularly the green bonds. They may buy some equities, uh, blue chip equities, but mainly they would be investing in private equity type of things. Uh, so projects in power, uh, that give a return, projects in power, projects in infrastructure. But it needs to be really driven by the, the private sector. But because we've been talking about these big flows now for a few months. I can see um, in the financial community here, there are groups that are starting to recognize it. They put together the right fund structure, they'll attract it. So we don't want, Fed, I don't think the country needs government money for this. It needs support from the Diaspora Commission in a kind of moral sense, but it really needs to be a private sector initiative to create a big fund. Now, how much would make a difference? I mean, I think to begin with, probably a fund should aim at least at 500 million. But over a few years, the fund would have to be 5 billion, 6 billion, 10 billion to really make a difference to Nigeria. Okay, uh, Dr. Levin, let's speak about the human angle uh, to this financial or to this capital that we're seeing in the form of remittances, the human angle of uh, harnessing the demography of Nigerians abroad. You see that a lot of Nigerians are abroad in the US, in the United Kingdom, Qatar. UAE, uh, the Asian countries, and all of that. And you see that there are also a lot of professional Nigerians. If you go to the United States, for example, perhaps for even medical purposes, you'll be surprised that when the doctor comes in through the door, the professional doctor is in Nigeria, not even in the UK. You know, and you're saying, why are they going there? Why aren't they even staying here? Because our systems aren't as developed and our systems are not giving them as much value as they give them abroad. How should we begin uh, to harness the, that demography, the human demography? How should, you, how should Nigeria begin to utilize that uh, demography that we have in uh, uh, the diaspora? Well, I mean, to begin with, you're exactly right, Nancy, that, that you know, why are people leaving? They're leaving because they've acquired certain skills and they're not able to get the opportunity to use those skills or not able to earn the financial returns. And you know, we could argue about the brain drain from Nigeria, but this is where we're at um, right now. And of course, it is holding up the economy. So I don't think we can be critical of the fact this is happening, but I think we, it should be a message to uh, everyone in Nigeria and to the, to the public sector and the federal government in particular, that as long as it's this attractive, relatively this attractive to move to the diaspora, whether it's Canada, the US, the UK, Qatar, Europe increasingly now, it's a signal that we're not creating opportunities for young professionals here. And of course, even at PwC, 
we suffer uh, really every week from departure to, to Canada in particular at the present time. So I, I think that the, the federal government diaspora commission should embrace the diaspora because it's an asset, but it should also be sending a signal to the rest of the federal government, you know, how do we create the conditions that people are going to want to want to come back uh, here? I mean, obviously doctors is a very difficult thing. We're losing a lot of doctors. We're short of doctors. Um, they, we don't need to pay in Nigeria levels that they're earning in Canada or the U.S. to keep them, but we need to have some reasonable compensation in some reasonable working conditions, and right now that's being not being offered to these professionals. But I do think it should be a test for the government of whether we're able to retain more and more of our young professionals. Now, let's move to mobilization of debt capital, which you also talked about in your article. Uh, I, I do know that we ha we need massive finance in terms of um, you know advancing Nigeria's infrastructure. Yeah, about a hundred billion dollars yearly. Where are we going to get that from for a country right now that is basking in a debt of about 24 uh, trillion naira? What do you think? How can we bring back debt capital? Is there a magic wine that, can, that we can use to resuscitate or to resurrect, rather, debt capital? Debt capital come back to life because they are just all over us. Well, I think, I mean, absolutely. So to begin with, we've talked for a long time about the lack of investment. And of course, we often talk about the need for foreign investment to plug this gap. But in this paper, we came out and said, look, even before we talk about foreign investment, we need to talk about the capital that's available in Nigeria right now. And the biggest source of capital, whether Nigeria or anywhere in the world, is, is real estate. Um, because everyone needs a place to live. Everyone needs a place to work. And in fact, two thirds of the world's assets are real estate assets. But our real estate assets in Nigeria are not very productive. They're not easily sold. So for a simple example, you're in one part of Lagos, you have a plot of land, you want to move in with your sister and then be able to use the, that capital to start a business. So increasing the productivity of, of the economy and increasing your income. That's not an easy process because the, the land system is so difficult. Now, of course, if we don't have clear title to land, it's very difficult to get a mortgage, and then it's very difficult to get housing because no one can pay for building the house all at one time. They need a mortgage. So all of those things create this dead capital. And even before we think so much about attracting foreign investment, what PwC is saying is let's unlock the uh, let the dead capital that we have. And you know, what are the steps to do? We're not the only country that's faced this. We need to have clear titling for land. Uh, particularly in urban areas. We need to have a mortgage system that supports it. We need to have uh, lower fees for being transferring land, faster processes for perfecting who owns the land. We've come out in terms of a technology solution. We have been big advocates of PwC of, of the blockchain technology. Everyone's heard of blockchain now because then you have a record of who owns the land, who has the mortgage, what was the last uh, time it was sold? Have taxes been paid? What was the last valuation? That's all on the blockchain. So we would like to see every state move to to improve its uh, land use system, its uh, land transfer system, really to get the real estate market growing. The other part about real estate that's critical is that building houses is the biggest uh, thing that will have an impact on youth unemployment in this country. So it absorbs so many people, uh, obviously the people on the building site, the plumbers, the carpenters, the electricians, they need to be fed when they're on the building site. When we're building low cost housing, we're using locally sourced materials. So we have up, upstream employment. And of course, if someone buys a house, they not all right away, but over time they furnish it. So it's such a big driver of employment and the alleviation of poverty, we need to see the re the real estate market, and particularly residential real estate, unlocked in this country. Mm. What do you think that we can do? Because we even have a lot of real estate that are unoccupied. Here in Abuja, there's no streets if you turn to, especially the highbrow areas, you see that they are under lock and key. Uh, after being built for some time, no one is staying there. In fact, some years ago, I was very inquisitive, and I entered one of the houses here in Asokoro. Uh, that was many years ago, and I asked them, oh, how, much, how much does this house go for? And they told me a billion naira, and I actually walked, <laughs> walked out of, of the place. But what I wanted to really establish is how much those real estates are going for. Why do you think that we have 
all these houses empty, yet Nigeria still has a 17 million or 18 million house in deficit? Well, I think the answer, and your viewers would under, all, all know this, is a lot of the, 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 the black money in Nigeria has, mm. the money that stays in Nigeria is funneled into high-end real estate, and it's highly unproductive, bad use of the land. I mean, I think one step that to, to and I, you know, I'm not going to comment on the court actions around these things, but the one step from an economic viewpoint that would be helpful is to make sure there's a, a clear tax system. So if you have more expensive real estate, um, you, you pay higher tax. If your real estate's in central Abuja or in the nice areas of Abuja or, or in Victoria Island, you pay more tax. If you fail to pay the tax, then the state takes over that property and they can sell it to someone else to be redeveloped or, or resold, etc. So we need to get the real estate um, market moving faster. I mean, it's exactly the same thing in Lagos. In the area that I live in, there's a number of very expensive buildings that are effectively unoccupied. I don't know who the owners are, but I suspect, again, it's dark money. They don't want to necessarily highlight that they own the building. They don't necessarily need to um, uh, rent it out because they built it with cash. But we need to put in some policies that help unlock that across the country because having the dead asset is costing all Nigerians. Dr. Devin, how do we unlock domestic savings? Because also in, in, your, in, in your reports, you said, or in your article, you said that we do not have enough uh, domestic savings. How do we begin to unlock that? Is it because of the poverty inherent in the land? Or what exactly is driving that? Well, I think, I mean, uh, unlocking the dead capital and land will, will help because the economy will grow faster, we'll have more savings. I mean, we need more. We're not going to be able to save enough if we continue to grow at 2% a year because, of course, it means per capita we're getting poorer and poorer. And people are under tremendous uh, financial pressure. You can see it in fast-moving consumer goods companies. They're under pressure with their pricing uh, across the board in Nigeria. So we need faster economic growth. But I think there is one pool of domestic capital that's really starting to have an impact, which, of course, is our pension industry, which I think the total assets in the PFA is starting to approach $8 trillion. And I think that they are going to be, they're very professionally managed. They have to provide a return because this is retirees, uh, future retirees' money. And what you're seeing is they are upping the standards in terms of the types of projects that we do, what they invest in. Of course, people want to tap that pension money for infrastructure, but the, the PFAs are pushing back and saying, yes, it can be used for infrastructure, but projects need to be well-structured. They need to provide a return. They need to have good governance. So I think you're going to find that that pool of capital makes a huge difference to the development of Nigeria. What they're not going to do is just put money into projects that uh, end up uh, going bankrupt or, be, or never coming on stream because they recognize if they do that in 10 or 15 years, we're going to have a catastrophe because people have put away money into these pension plans and aren't going to get the return. So I really see that as a positive force in terms of domestic capital. Now, let's talk about the shrinking public sector, uh, which you uh, talked about. Uh, you said in every, and let me quote you, in a, in a very real sense, we have almost no public sector that impacts people's lives in a significant way. Uh, what do you mean by that, if we take a look at the Nigerian public sector? Well, just in terms of the, the numbers here, if you go back to the year 2000, the numbers that we have, the official numbers, tell us that the public sector was maybe 23 to 25 percent of the um, of the economy or activity uh, and over the years that number has just shrunk and shrunk and shrunk so the total spending by all three levels of government in nigeria in 2018 is about uh, 14 trillion naira and our economy is about 140 trillion in naira so 10 percent only 10 percent and of that uh one and a half trillion i believe is spent on interest so the total amount spent on other activities is less than 9%. So if you take uh, security, infrastructure, education, health care, the cost of administration, and all levels of government, it's a very, very small number. And if you put it in per capita terms, that $14 trillion spending by the public sector in Nigeria at all levels is only 70,000 Naira per person. And, and of course, 10,000 Naira of that is uh, interest. So 
we have 60,000 Naira per person being spent, again, for education, uh, infrastructure, healthcare, security, et cetera. It's simply not enough. So then what have Nigerians done? If the state is not delivering those basic necessities to you, then people are going to organize their own way of delivering it. So Nigerians organize their own security, their own power, mm. their own infrastructure, their own um, health care, and their own education. And they've, in effect, moved on from uh, expecting the state to provide the informal sector, the big informal sector in the country, just uh, last week or so, the National Bureau of Statistics as well as Sumedian brought out uh, the MSME survey and they tell us that we have about 41 million MSMEs uh, in the country. In your article, you also made mention that Nigerians are going ahead to organize themselves in the absence of the state. Just like you said a moment ago, you see Nigerians providing their roads, pipe bomb water, uh, you know, healthcare, the move abroad to, uh, to sort their healthcare out and all of that. How much, how much attention should we begin to direct uh, to the informal sector? And what you say in your article, self-organization. Well, I think to begin with that um, people need to r realize just how large it is. So in economic terms, I mean, we've heard up to 65%. I was with uh, the IMF head here in Nigeria yesterday. He was thinking the most recent number is 50 to 55 percent. Whether it's 50 percent or 65 percent, it's it really is the majority of the economy. Um, to put this in perspective, for example, in Lagos State, 85 percent of students in primary and secondary school go to private schools. So you tend to think of education as something delivered by the state, but it's not being delivered by the state. It's being delivered by private schools, and many of these. Uh, and of course, if it's 85%, it's not just for wealthy Nigerians, it's for all Nigerians, and the, including people at the bottom of the pyramid, are sending their children to private schools. Now, of course, many of these schools are informally organized. Um, they don't fully have all of the licenses that you would want to do this. Um, um, but w what we can't do, I think, is, is fight the informal sector. And so, sometimes you see in Nigeria attempts by the state to kind of shut down the formal sec informal sector. Uh, we think that's a mistake. We think the, the state needs to recognize the criticality of the informal sector. I mean, it's educating, in this example, 85% of the students in Lagos, and needs to make policy changes that encourage people to move from the informal to the formal sector over time. Because while the informal sector delivers something, it doesn't deliver as well as the formal sector. But the problem right now in Nigeria is that people choose to be in the informal sector because there are so many barriers to being in the formal sector. There's huge costs involved, there's many agencies you have to deal with, uh, et cetera. So they choose to stay in the informal sector. So what we would like to see is more recognition of, of the relationship between the informal and formal sectors, and then a deliberate strategy that says, we need to make it attractive to come from the informal sector to the sector. So that means, if I had to put it in one word, a lot more simplification. Because in Nigeria, we suffer enormously from uh, complexity. So many agencies, so many levels of government, and it just is impeding our ability to bring companies and individuals and institutions into the formal sector. Finally, because you, you talked about five issues in your uh, article, uh, the last one is Nigeria's brand, that we have a poor brand value, and that is responsible uh, for Ghana, our next door our neighbor, for getting so much FDI, the highest FDI in West Africa. And in fact, Ghana has also gone ahead to have the Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Area. That's where the Secretariat will be. Uh, like I said during the beginning of this interview, that sometimes I struggle with what the Nigerian brand is. You know, as a Nigerian, I'm wondering, what is my brand as a Nigerian? Well, I think the brand issue, you know, those of us, I mean, when we're sitting in, you know, for me in Lagos, and I mean, we have challenges, but the reality that's portrayed outside of, of Nigeria is not, that's not what we, we experience here. Um, and I think that it, it is impeding us because uh, it means that when people in London or New York or Frankfurt are thinking about investing here, you know, they start with this negative brand perception, so it's an uphill battle. And of course, it doesn't help, not in Abuja, but certainly in Lagos, the, just the poor state of our international airport as a first entry point you know, doesn't, doesn't help that. But, but I've had so many experiences with 
visitors that have come here, business people that have come here, uh, and they say after two or three days, it's nothing like I expected. The problem with that, I mean, which is great, but the problem with that is, of course, only a few people come, right? So the brand perception that we have among people who don't come to this country is very poor. Now, we haven't really spoken about this issue at PwC for the last number of years, and the reason we didn't was we weren't sure what the answer is. But we think the time, because it's such a big impediment to moving forward, we're putting it on the agenda now. We'd like to get a conversation going in the country that, that says, how do we project um, what, what Nigeria stands for? Because, of course, there are so many. I mean, the energy of the people, we know that. But you look at the Nollywood exports, you look at uh, you know, our financial services companies, what they're doing around um, Africa, et cetera. I mean, it's just we have a very powerful story to tell, and we're not we're not telling it very well. And a lot of people, whether I'm in Japan or in the UK or in the Middle East or in Canada, when I say I live in Nigeria and I've lived here for 10 years, over 10 years now, um, you know, I always get questions that just just show how poor our brand is. And of course, the the, the official reports. There was one that was done recently that had us ranked. 74th out of the 80 countries in terms of brand perception on that. And so it, it, any business, if they had a brand issue like that, would start to, to take steps to work on their, on, their, on their brand image. Now, what's interesting is if you go back to the diaspora, one thing that it does help our brand is we have so many professionals in the diaspora who are doing fantastic things. So for many, many people uh, in the countries where our diaspora goes, Nigerian diaspora, so UK, US, Canada predominantly. That's that's the impression they're getting of Nigeria, young, talented professionals. So that's a positive. And we need some effort by, and this is really a federal government. Better Nigerian. I want to say thank you very much, Dr. Nevin, for joining me this morning to speak about these issues, socioeconomic issues. Uh, have a lovely weekend. But meanwhile, before you go, how is the weather in Lagos? I told you earlier, it's raining cats and dogs here in Abuja. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we, we've had the rainy season. that had some difficulty. I'm just looking outside here over Echo Atlantic. It's cloudy today, so we'll see uh, if it starts raining. But, uh, yeah, no, we've had a lot of challenges with the rain over the past uh, two or three weeks. And, of course, when it rains heavily here, parts of Lagos get uh, flooded. Flooded. And it's very difficult to... Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Nevin. Have a f wonderful weekend. Bye now. Very well. Thank you so much. All right. I've been uh, speaking with uh, Dr. Andrew Nevin, who is the chief economist at uh, Price Waterhouse.